Today we're going to learn Eruvin Daf Kuf Dalid. We are almost at the end, the very final stretch. One more page after this, and uh, I will see you all at the Siyum. I hope you will all be there. Okay, we're going to start with the Mishnah on Kuf Dalid. Buzkim Melech Again, we're discussing things that can be done in the temple, but not outside the temple. You can crush up pieces of salt and throw it on the ramp. Okay, this was in order to make sure that the Kohanim don't slip. You have to think about all the details they had to think about in the temple, right? To make sure that something wasn't slippery in case it got wet. So they would pour salt on it. And you can fill up from the Bor HaGolad and the Bor HaGadol. These were two Boro, two wells that were um, cisterns that were in the temple with a Gilgal. They had a, a, a wheelie, a pulley system, okay, a wheel system. So you'll be able to use the wheel to lift it up because then it's not exerting yourself too much and that's why it was allowed. And the Be'er HaKir was only allowed on Yom Tov, not on Shabbat. Apparently it didn't have the Gilgal, and therefore it, you weren't allowed to do it on Shabbat. Okay, we're going to talk about what the issue with the salt is. The salt seems to be an issue of building. You're kind of building, you're, you're flattening out the ramp, or you're, right, you're making it more smooth. That's a tolada of building. Rami Le Rav Ika, we're going to have to see if it's building, well, then that should be forbidden by Torah law, right? Why is it only forbidden by rabbinic law and therefore allowed in the temple? Rami Le Rav Ika, mi parchshunya l'rava. Tanan, it says in our Mishnah, he's going to bring a contradiction now, just like we have with the previous Mishnayot. Bozki melech agabe akevesh b'shvil shalo yachliku, b'shvil shalo yachliku. So now this is only on the ramp of the altar. There was this huge ramp that went up the altar, the main altar we're talking about, not the altar for the incense, which was inside the Heichal, inside the sanctuary. We're talking about the one that was outside. It was in the space called the Azara. Today we're going to talk about the different spaces. Um, this was the big altar where they sacrificed the animals on. So now they say, It sounds like this is only allowed in the temple and not outside the temple. Urimini, but that contradicts the following source. If you have a courtyard that was ruined by rainwater, you bring straw and you can flatten it out. So they say, so here you see, you could do this even outside the temple. So they say, no, Shani Tevin de Lomavatale. The Tevin, you don't actually intend for it to stay there. It's something animals eat. They'll come along and they'll eat it. It's not something that's meant to be permanent in any way. So therefore, you can put it down. Whereas the salt, you mean seemingly for it to stay. So What exactly? Let's talk about this. Really think the, the salt is to stay? If it's to stay, you're adding, forget Shabbat, you have a separate problem. You're adding to the temple something that wasn't supposed to be there. It says this in parentheses, but, but I'm going to read it anyway. Everything has to be done exactly the way it was told. Nobody ever said in the Torah, or there was no tradition of putting salt on the ramp. So how could you do that? And if you're not can't nullifying it, that you don't, you don't want it to stay there, well, then there's a separate problem. It's creating a separation between the feet of the Kohanim when they go up the ramp, there's going to be a separation between their feet. The Kohanim didn't wear shoes in the temple. Separation between their feet and the ramp. We learned yesterday that you can't have a separation between the hand and doing the, the avoda, right? If you hold a utensil, there can't be anything in between like the bandage, for example. So likewise here, you're going to end up with salt separated between the feet and the ramp. That's going to be a problem. So the Gemara says, well, that's only a problem when you're actually doing work, right? What we call avoda in the temple, worship. So let's see. So now they say, when you're bringing one of the things they went on the ramp, they would bring the pieces of meat that were parts of the body that were supposed to be sacrificed on the temple, on the altar, they would bring. That's lava avoda here. In other words, what's avoda? Avoda is the burning of it. Avoda is the, the sprinkling of the blood. This isn't avoda. This is just getting on the way to do the work. So then we don't care about a chatzitza. But now they say, no, velo, is that really true? It's not a voda, v'haktiv. It says, v'kriva kohenet hakol, brings everything, v'ktira mizbecha. What does it mean, v'kriva kohenet hakol? Normally we say, v'kriva is sacrifice. Amar mar, but it's said about this, zo alachat evarim lakevesh. This is the carrying of the, the pieces of meat to the ramp. Ela ema, 
Therefore, it can't be. That's actually a voda. So you can't put salt on before you carry the pieces to the up the ramp. And the Ema, it must be talking about Baholachat Itzim Lamaracha. It must be when you carry the wood to the top, which is where the Maracha is, where they made the fire, that Delav Avodahi. That's just preparation work. That's not the Avoda. That's when we're talking about you were allowed to put salt on. Darish Rava. Rava now taught. That's what we saw before. So you have a courtyard that had rain. You can put straw down in order to, to prevent people from slipping there, right? Or to fix up the ground. But wait a minute. Doesn't the bright to say, You can't do this in a normal way. You can't take a basket and throw the straw on or, or a box. But what do you do? You let it kind of drop out the bottom of the box. Okay, you do it what we call with a shinoi, with some sort of change. So they put Rav in, a, in the corner. What does Rav say? And this is a great, great line. It's great that they're ending the Masechah with this because it's a real lesson for life in general. Hadar okim Rav emora ale. Rav brought an emora. Emora was usually someone who taught the Torah of the rabbi to other people. He brings an emora and he says, V'darash, you ready for this? Whatever I just taught you is a mistake. I made a big mistake. This is what they said in the name of Rabbi Elazar. So as Rabbi Papa says to him, said, ah, oh, this is, right, you were right, Rabbi Papa, and I'm quoting now in the name of Rabbi Elazar that in fact, you have to do it with a change. Okay, why is this so great? It's obvious, but right, how often do you have a leader who gets up and says, not only did he teach it, you know, he could have just taught it the other way and then is, made it as if, oh, that's what I meant from the beginning. But instead, he gets up and he admits his mistake. And he says, right, I admit I made a mistake, right? Halavai, our leaders should do the same. Ula, okay, now we're back to Memalimi Borha Gola, back to the Mishnah. Ula Ikla Lebe Rafanashi came to the house of Ramanasha, Atau Gabra Tarech Ab. Taraf Ababa. Someone came and started knocking on the door. Amal Manhai Litchal Gufe de Kamachile Shapta. His body should be destroyed, desecrated, because he has desecrated the Sabbath. Why is he desecrated Shabbat? What did he do? He made a noise, and it's forbidden to make noise on Shabbat. Okay, now we're going to have a whole discussion about this, but you can't knock on a door. So Amale Raba Loas Ruela Kol Shel Shir. What do you mean? It's only forbidden singing because what are we worried? The whole concern of making noise on Shabbat is that we're worried you're going to pull out musical instruments and your musical instruments will be broken and you'll fix them on Shabbat like we saw with the with the harp the other day. So what do you see here? It's only kol shel shir. This is just banging on the door. By the way, we passed in halacha lama said that if it's a knocker and if you knock like in a rhythmic way, then it's a problem. If you just do a regular knock at the door, it's not a problem. I'm a little, um, so ATV Abai. Abai now brings a question on Rabba. What you said, it's only kosher shir. I'm going to show you it's not. It's any kind of noise. Ma'alim bidiofi, you can bring up liquids. You can move them with a siphon. Umitifim miyarek, or you can drip them, drip out liquids with a miyarek, okay, which is some sort of utensil, kind of like a rattle where you would drop the water and it would make this noise, okay? Lechole b'shabat. So you can to drop out water with the sing-songy noise coming from this rattle-type instrument for a, someone who's sick on Shabbat. Now, what does this seem to imply? in lo. You can only do this for a sick person, not for a healthy person. Now, hechidami, what's the point? Why are you do, using this rattle? What's the noise for? And he wants to basically prove this is a noise of a song. And look, it's forbidden unless it's for a sick person. Is it not that he's sleeping and we want to wake him up, but we want to wake him up more gently than someone else because he's sick? From here, you can infer any kind of noise is forbidden. So now they say, No, it's like a nursery rhyme or a, what do you call it? A, forgetting the word, but a, a lullaby, right? It's, it's, you want to make this noise to lull him into sleep. Okay, and that's why, and therefore it is music. Eitivay, another question against Rabbi. You're protecting your fruits from the birds or your gourds from the animals. So 
So you can watch them on Shabbat in the regular manner. There's nothing forbidden about that. As long as you don't clap and bang and dance the way they normally do it. Apparently they would dance around and, and make a lot of noise to keep the animals away. So what do you see here? My time, alab de kamoli kala. Doesn't this sound like just any kind of noise? Because you're not doing this for singing purposes. For kololu de kala asir. And then any kind of banging noise is forbidden. No, this has nothing to do with the noise you're making. This has to do with a separate problem. Normally, on the weekday, you might dance around and, and clap to get them away, but you also would sometimes throw rocks at them. And you can't throw rocks on Shabbat because rocks are muksa. So this is a way of telling you, make sure not to throw rocks. So do the whole way you watch has to be different so that you don't accidentally come to throw a stone toward them. Right? They didn't throw rocks at them, but they would throw a stone kind of in the direction where they were coming in order to prevent them from coming to their, their crops. Another question. So Rashi explains that the, the second to last Rashi on the page, uh, the second to last, sorry, line of Rashi on the page, they would kind of roll nuts on a, on a flat surface. Um, so it's own, they would hit into each other. It was some sort of game they would play. And what seems to be the problem? It's making noise, all the nuts banging against each other. So that's why it's forbidden. My time, I love to come all the color. You see any kind of noise. So now they say it. No, it's because you might end up flattening out the ground. Why? Because in order to play the game, you need a flat surface. So you flatten out the ground. And remember, we learned about that when we talked about sweeping in the Shabbat. It's because you're flattening out the ground. Again, sweeping if it's on dirt, not on flat floors like we have. But, um, but you might come to flatten out the ground before you play. And that's the problem. So again, these problems have nothing to do with sounds and making noise. Because if you don't say that, he says, girl, women playing with apples is forbidden, right? It's interesting. You get an eye into what kind of games they played in those days. They're playing with apples. The apples don't bang against each other or make a noise. It's not a noisy game. It's again, the issue that they roll these apples. And again, you're going to need a flat surface in order to play the game. Um, right. It's, it's nice to know the women weren't only in the kitchen and drawing the water and all those things, but they actually had time to play games. Forget about what games they played. Just the fact that they did play games is interesting. So again, we say, there's no noise there. It must be that you're worried about flattening out the ground. Tonight, let's look at our Mishnah. Right. So you can raise it up with this wheel. What do you see? You can only do this in the temple and not outside the temple. My time, is it not because when you use that galgal, it must make a noise. And because of that, we don't allow it outside, right? Because in general, it's not heavy if you do it like that. So it's not too much work. And therefore, why wouldn't it be allowed everywhere else? So they say, we're worried that you're going to, that you're going to take the water from there and use it for other things that are forbidden, like watering your garden, okay? Or your churva, your, your, um, your desolate house. I'm not sure exactly what you're watering in the churva, but we're worried that you're going to end up using the water for watering crops, which is forbidden on Shabbat. That's a toladav zorea, planting. He actually allowed people, on this note, we're going to have a side thing. He allowed people to fill up from this water well in the Chosa. Why am My time So that's their whole concern. Well, we don't have either of those in our town. Therefore, there's no concern. This goes back to what we learned a few weeks ago about, can you make special dispensations for different places? Can you start saying, oh, well, for you, this isn't a concern, so it's okay, whereas for other people, yes. So he thought you could, but we'll see, he's mistaken. But then what happened? He started to see the taruba kidna. They started soaking their flax in the water. He realized that there is a problem because they're going to take extra water to soak their flax. And people were doing that. And he realized he made a mistake. Again, we have a lot of mistakes today that people make. And therefore, he changed his mind and he forbade it. Okay, now we're going to talk about this well. It's well called the Be'er Here we're going to try to figure out why it's called the Be'er 
אמר שמואל בורש, מי באר הקיר, אמר שמואל בורש היא תקועה לדברים ותראו, they, they had a lot of discussions about it and then they finally permitted it. מתי בי, they said, wait a minute, the בור הקיר is one particular well that they had a whole debate about? one sis, what? מתי בי, לא כל הבורות הקירות, תראו אלא זו בלבד. They didn't allow all of these בורות הקירות, only this one, which sounds like there were lots of them. If you say it was the one that they, did, you know, there was only one and they called it that because they had a whole discussion about it. My Zobovad, then Zobovad, this only doesn't make any sense. Sounds like there was only one Borha here and this sounds like there were a lot. Right, and therefore it doesn't work. So it must be Be'er Hakir means a Be'er of fresh water, fresh spring water. Okay, as they say in the following verse, which seems to connect with the, the be'er and the fresh water and this word kir. Gufa. Now we're going to go into deep depth about what this boar was and why they permitted it. Why did they only allow this one? They camped by there when they were going up, when in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back to Israel from Babylonia. They would stop by this well and they needed water to drink, so they allowed them to drink from there on Shabbat. Who permitted it? The Nevi'im, like Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, right? The last Malach, the last um, Nevi'im. But then they say, wait, no, fix this a little bit. Lo Nevi'im Shabbat It wasn't those Nevi'im that I just said, it wasn't those prophets. Ela min It was that they kept the tradition of their fathers. In other words, they saw their fathers do this Therefore, they also did this. In other words, they learned by example. And there's a Gemara that says, this comes up a few times, right? we assume that people have a certain halachic intuition and they understand what's right and what's wrong. And therefore, they followed what their ancestors did. Okay, Mishnah. We have all sorts of nice ideas here. In the, we're at the end of a Masechah. We're getting ideas about people making mistakes and correcting them. We're getting ideas about following the traditions of your fathers and how sometimes that's even more important than what a prophet might say. Um, okay, now we're moving into the, and, and the other thing we're going to have that we'll talk about later is this idea of the mikdash, maybe we'll discuss this at the sea and we'll see, um, the idea that we end our masechet with all these ideas about mikdash, okay, so we've been talking about space all around, the space of the courtyard, the mavoy, right, different spaces, and now we're going to get to different spaces in the temple, okay, specifically this mission is going to talk about the different spaces in the temple. It's going to sound very much like what we've been learning in our Masechet, and maybe it's this idea of taking our spaces and talking about sanctity of space, and therefore they use the, the Mishkan, the Beit HaMikdash as their example, the temple. Sheret Shenimtza Mikdash. You have all of a sudden a creepy crawler, one of the eight ones that are forbidden by the Torah. If they die, they carry impurity. And you have one in the temple. Now, the temple obviously can't become impure. You have one of these in the temple, and you need to get rid of it. And you need to get rid of it as soon as possible. So, kohem motzio behem yeno, shelo l'shotet hatuma. You don't want the coin to touch it. So what does he do? He puts it in uh, his, his belt, and he carries it outside as quickly as possible. Why his belt? Because that's like the quickest thing that he could find is the belt that's on his body. What's the problem with using his belt? Well, the belt has, is going to become impure. We don't want to... Cause Kohanim's clothing to become impure. So, according to the first opinion, we don't care. It's better to get rid of the sherets as quickly as possible. No, find uh, utensil tongs or something made of wood. Use those. In other words, take a break. Don't immediately get rid of it. Go look around. Find something. Wood does not become tame in this kind of form. Take it, use that, and get rid of the sherets that way. And that way, shalol rabot et And one said, we don't want to delay the tumah from getting out of there. And the other one says, no, but we don't want to create more tumah. This is a little bit like we talked about the other day. The difference between a shev al says sitting and doing nothing. Yes, it's true, the sherets is there, right? When you're in the tree, how do you get out of the tree? Is it better to get out of the tree so you don't create more problems while you're in the tree? Or maybe you're just better off sitting and doing nothing, right? Like here, maybe do nothing and let's find something else so that you won't. Right, but leave it there rather than removing it. And while you're removing it, you're actually doing something wrong by getting it, um, getting your clo the Kohanim's clothing impure. So that's the debate between them. Mehecha motzi'inotu. Now we have an issue that didn't, issue didn't relate to Shabbat. Now we have an issue that relates to Shabbat. How do you get it out? 
is we want to carry it. The problem is a sheretz is muktzah. So what are you allowed to do? You're allowed to carry it out, but to what, to which location? How far do you go? At a certain point, we say, okay, we don't really care if the sheretz is here anymore. We've gotten away from the main sanctified places. So again, you have to know the geography here of, or the, the map of where things were. So inside you have the Kodesh Kodeshim, that's the inner inner, right? That sits in the backside or the inside of the Hechal, the sanctuary. Outside the Hechal, there's an entrance area, this big wide um, area that was called the Ulam, the entrance area to the sanctuary. Then you have this area, if you leave the, ula, the Ulam, you're in the space that's called Bein Ulam Lamizbeach, between there and the altar, there's higher sanctity there. Then right, every step of the way, you're getting into less and less sanctity. Then you get to the Mizbeach. That's the big altar we were talking about with the ramp. And then that whole section is called the Azara. And then outside that is what they call the Azarat Nashim, even though it wasn't just women that were there. Already there, impure people can go. Okay, but there, you're not supposed to have impurity in all those other spaces. So now we're going to have a debate, how far can you take it? You would assume you would take it outside the Azara, but that, not everyone's going to agree about this. You can only take it from the sanctuary to this hall area, the vestibule, from there to the space between the Mizbeach and the vestibule, and that's it. it we leave it then in the Azara. The, the sanctity there is less sanctity, better not to move it anymore because of Muktza. If you were in the the Azara area, and you were impure, you had something impure, you'd end up, if you did it on purpose, you'd get karet, and if you did it unwittingly, you'd have to bring a korban chatat, so a, a sin offering. So therefore, any space like that, you get rid of it from there. Ushar and once you're out of there, kofin ala you just put something over it, you cover it with a basin or something. Rabbi Shimon Omer, makom shiti wilcha Rashi already tells us we don't really understand this yet. We'll see in the Gemara. But he says, where the rabbis allowed you to do it, they only let you do things that were by rabbinic law. They only allowed things that were forbidden by rabbinic law. So we're going to start with the statement of Shmuel and then we're going to connect it to our topic, to our Mishnah. If you bring a sheretz into the Mikdash, okay? There we were talking about you found it in the Mikdash. What if you bring it in? Are you obligated? He says you're obligated to Korban Chatat. But, sorry, I said it wrong. Hamachnis Tameh If you bring in something that was, that became impure from a Sheretz, then you're Chayav Chatat, then it's forbidden by Torah law. But Sheretz Atzmo, but fascinatingly, he says if you bring an actual Sheretz, which is a higher level of Tuma, you're Patul, you're exempt. Sounds very strange. Gemara is going to explain my time. Amar Kha. The Pasuk says in Sefer Dvarim, uh, Sefer Bamidbar, Parakeh, the fifth chapter of, of Bamidbar, it says, Mizachal ad nekevat From male to female, if they become impure, send them out of the camp. Mikhutz uh, tishachum, send them out. Velo yitamu amachanehem asher nishachem et chamen. Don't let them it, cause the place where I live to become impure. That's what God says. So what do they learn from this? So it has to be something that's like a zachar ad nekeva. What's unique about a zachar ad nekeva? Only things that can be purified in a mikvah. This means basically a sheretz can never become pure by putting it in a mikvah. It doesn't purify it. But humans, if they become tamay, they can go into a mikvah. Likewise, most utensils, we'll see not all, but most utensils can go in the mikvah also. So if you bring in a utensil that's tameh, you bring in a person that's tameh, you are you become obligated, right? I assume they're not really talking about a person. I assume they're talking about utensils. But if you bring the sheretz itself, says Shmuel, you're not obligated by Torah law because it's not like Zachar and Kevad can't be purified in the mikvah. Lema Maseyale, why don't we say the following source supports him? Here comes a bright. This comes to exclude an earthenware vessel. So my time, what's his reason? What's unique about the klicheres? You remember earthenware vessels? The only way to purify them is to break them. There is no way. You can't put them in a mikvah. So that must be why. 
So they say, lo, that, no, that's not the reason and that doesn't support Shmuel. Mishnah said avatuma. It's only something that can, there's another explanation here. It's only something that can become the highest level tuma, like a person and certain utensils can become an avatuma, but a kli cheres can never become an avatuma. And therefore, yatsa kli cheres, she no not say avatuma. It's a special law they learned from the Torah that an earthenware vessel can never become an avatuma. Okay, the highest level of tuma. Lema kitinai. So let's go back to Shmuel. Maybe what Shmuel said, first we tried to say maybe we could support Shmuel from the statement. We said, no, that doesn't support Shmuel. It doesn't teach you anything uh, relating to what Shmuel said. But Lema kitinai, maybe there's a machloket tanaim about this. And he sides on one side of the debate. Sheretz shenim tzabe mikdash. Now we're going to learn our Mishnah. We're going to actually see, we're going to do this with both parts of our Mishnah. If you find a Sheretz in the temple, in order not to keep the Tuma in there, we quickly, right, we get it out as quick as possible. No, you go look around till you find wooden tongues. Because we don't want to make more things impure. Is this not the root of their machloket? Demand amal shelo lishot kasavar machni sheretz lamikdash chayav. He's saying get it out as quickly as possible because if someone were to bring it in, they'd be obligated chatat by Torah law. So therefore, that that means it's very severe, which means let's get it out as quickly as possible. Umanda amar shelo lrabo kasavar machni sheretz lamikdash patur. And the one who says it's just that we don't want to create more tamei things, right? And as We'd rather not make anything else tame. And he's not so concerned with get it out as quickly as possible. He must hold. If you bring the sherets into the into the temple, you're exempt. So now the Gemara rejects this and says, look, Everyone agrees that you're obligated. And now we're going to explain it the way we explained it in the first place. Both of them really don't agree with Shmuel at all. Both of them think having the sherets is a really bad thing. It's just a matter of if you have to weigh what's worse and what's right, better well what's the worst of two evils so better one says better get rid of it as soon as possible the other one says better don't get anything else to me on the way so now let's try again tonight maybe which Shmuel says is a machlika between the following tanaim at the end of our mission right, from where do you take it out all the way from the azara or do you leave it you can leave it in the azara you don't have to take it out of there so again you don't take it out of the azara. That's Shimon ben Nanas. Kasavar machni sheretz lemikdash patur. He doesn't view this as so terrible. Therefore, if you leave it in the azara, it's okay. Uman damar mikula azara. The one who says from the whole azara, he would hold kasavar chayav. You got to get rid of it because it's very problematic to bring the sheretz in, and therefore, if it's in here, you got to get rid of it even from the azara. Okay, you'll have to wait till tomorrow, till the siyum actually to see what actually, whether we stick with this or whether we reject this also. And some more about it, and then we will finish the Masechet. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Tov to everybody. And Mazal Tov, I'm almost finishing.